go. Uh, so one thing that's not on there, which I announced, whenever it was I announced it, it was Monday. So I announced Monday was that in general, homeworks will be due in class on Wednesdays, and you'll get them back on Mondays in recitation. You don't have recitation next Monday because it's Labor Day. So this time, you're on your own for the homework. Um, my office hours, I think, are on there. There are Tuesdays from 1.30 to 3.30, and then also Friday mornings from 11 to 12 over in the math, uh, on the P level of the math building where my primary function is to advise students who want to be majors or mess with their classes or whatever, but I'm there so you can talk to me if you have a question. Oh, yeah, why don't you say uh, rear end is, uh, say, uh, We don't do that anymore. Oh, okay, that's gone. Okay. So, so the, the, schedule, the calendar has been readjusted so that there is exactly one Monday holiday, one Tuesday holiday, one uh, Thursday, one Wednesday, one Thursday, one Friday, so we don't have to shuffle days. So we get, so next Tuesday is Labor Tuesday because we need a Tuesday holiday, so it's the one after the Monday holiday. So, I mean it works. So there won't be any, well today your calendar says it's Tuesday, but it's really Friday. None of that is here. Other questions? Nope? Okay. Um, so as I said before, I'm trying, I'm going to take this. I will hope that this will function properly. I'll put it up on the website. It will probably take at least a day and probably a couple days for me to edit it and do the junk I need to do to make it webbable. Um, so if you want to hope that it will work, that means that you don't need to take as careful notes as you would otherwise. Um, or you could do what I do and that's just never take any notes and then read the book and listen and think. I strongly encourage you to pay more attention to what's going on and work on understanding as it's going rather than trying to get down everything I say because most of what I say is in the book in a different form and I hope there will also be the video of it. So it's much more important that you focus on following what's going on rather than taking careful notes. But for some people, taking careful notes is how you follow what's going on, so that's fine, yeah. Do I take pictures in class? Whatever. Yeah, I, I'm not shy. It's fine. <laughs> Don't come over to my house and take a picture while I'm in the shower. <laughs> um, any other questions? So there is a homework assignment. It's not really long. I don't think it's really hard. That is due one week from today. And yes, that's like seven days. Uh, whatever, seven times 24, that many hours. You can do the arithmetic better than me. Okay, so I'm going to pick up, remember what I'm doing? I'm going to pick up roughly where I'm going to review not at all. So you're screwed, too bad, ha uh ha. -huh. Um, so if you remember, we're what we're trying to do at this point is we're trying to recast some of the standard notions that you were familiar with in algebra slash Cartesian geometry, whatever so that it works in more dimensions. And what we're doing here to generalize, say, the notion of a line, which in two dimensions, we can write as y equals mx plus b, if you want. Uh, I don't actually like that formula, so let me not do it that way. Let's write it as y minus y naught equals m times x minus x naught, because that has a little more meaning this is review, so anyway, so that means that we have some point x naught y naught that sits on the line, and we can recast this in a slightly more general form where we think of this as really saying, this is really saying, go to the land of x naught, go to the point x naught y naught, and move off in the direction that goes up m units for every one unit you go over and that's just a direction and just go some distance in that way. So this is just saying the same thing in a different way. We go to this point 
and then we move in that direction some amount. And that gives us everybody out of the line. So this red thing can be viewed as the vector, which I could write this way. Let's see, that's the y. I could write it as a column vector like this. I won't do that mostly because it's tedious, which I might also write it this way, which says that when I go one unit in the x direction, I go m units in the y direction. Okay, so either way. And really, let's just think of this as some vector v. Um, and so now I can rewrite this line as saying, start at the origin, go to the point x naught, y naught, and then move some distance in the direction of the vector v. So every point on this line is really can be viewed as points of the form x naught, y naught, plus some number t, which is how far I go in the v direction. That's the same thing. It's just another way to view how this line can be described. So if I want to think about this point over here, it's go there and then move, it looks like, about four times the length of that vector here. If I want to think about this point over here on that line, it's go there and back up about two and a half times the length of the vector, and so on. So that describes all of these points. These are, of course, vectors, but we think of them as vectors that point from the origin to that point on the line. And the advantage of doing that, instead of using this formula, is that that notion works just as well in any number of dimensions. So that if I'm working in three-dimensional space, and I've got some point here sitting out in three-dimensional space, given three coordinates, x naught, y naught, that's supposed to be a z, z naught, I can play the same game. I say, go to that point, so that's this vector, and then from that point, pick some direction that you want to go. How about this way? And then just take everything that moves in the same direction as this vector by some scale of that. So this line, which is a little harder to visualize in three dimensions, I guess it punctures the plane just about here, so that's below. Um, in my visualization of what's going on here. This describes that line because it just says go here and then move that way by some amount t. So if we call this vector v again, then these guys are exactly the same form. This line is the stuff of the form. In fact, let's call this guy, uh, I don't know, a. This is everything of the form, a, plus t times v, right? And, if, and this will work in any number of dimensions. If I'm in a 17-dimensional space, which is a little hard to draw, I will have a vector in R17 plus t times a direction in R17. And that will describe everything on that line. Let's go there and then move off that way. And this is sort of naturally how you might think of a line uh, as well. You know, go down to the beach and aim your camera that way. And what do you see? Everything there. It's exactly the same. Okay? So this is what we did last time. Um, let's just see if anybody understands. So what's the equation of the line through the point, let's take two points. One, two, three, and four, five, six. So if you understand, you should be able to answer that question. Or at least walk me through how to do that. So, so don't just tell me the answer, tell me what you do. Yeah? 
Well, first you want to find the theta between the two points. Okay, so let me draw a cartoon of what's going on. Here's one, two, three. Here's four, five, six. And I want to find the vector between them. Okay, so what's the vector between them? Can you get that by subtracting? Okay, so that should be like three, three, three. three. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's just amazing how that worked out. So this vector is the vector with coordinates three, three, three. Uh, now you can use either of the two points as your initial point. Okay. And then you add um, the plus t times the vector three, three, three. Okay. So the so this will be, let's use one, two, three. It'll be one, two, three, plus t times three, three, three. Good. Anybody confused about that? Now we can write this in a slightly different way. We can put them together. This is one plus three t, two plus three t, three plus three t. So if we don't like vectors, you can see that we are actually describing this line by telling you all x coordinates of the form 1 plus 3t, y of the form 2 plus 3t, z of the form 3 plus 3t. So we can also describe this instead of in vector form as x is 1 plus 3t, y is 1, sorry, 2 plus 3t, and z is 3 plus 3t. So those three equations together also are another way to describe this line. It's the collection of points that look like that. And these are, I mean, these are really exactly the same, just written out in a slightly different form. So you pick the t value, and then we know where we are in the line. There's actually a little more information here than just the line. There's sort of an implied speed that if I increase t by one unit, then these guys increase by three units. And so this is the same line in terms of the set of points. This line, let me write it in vector form. One plus s, let's use t. They're not the same t. Two plus t, three plus t. They're not the same t, so I really should use this is, I don't know, T1. I don't know why I'm using T, but I am. This is the same line in terms of points, but the speed is one third slower. If I increase T by one unit, I only move a third of the way to four, five, six. Whereas here, if I increase T by one unit, I move all of the way to four, five, six. But since we're only paying attention at this point to the collection of points that are described by this, these are the same line. Just like you can drive down the LIE at 30 miles an hour, you'll probably get rear-ended, but you can. Or you can drive down the LIE at 80 miles an hour. You're traveling the same path, but you'll get there a lot quicker at 80 miles an hour unless you get arrested. <laughs> um, so you can do either one. And they're the same path, but at different speeds. And so sometimes you care about the parameterization, the way you're describing this collection of points, and sometimes you just care about the collection of points. Right? So here the speed is different. Um, and of course, I don't have need the same base point either. I could use 456 as, what's your name? Nick. As Nick said, I will maybe remember next time I see you that your name's Nick, but please forgive me if I don't. Okay. Um, but maybe by the end of the semester I'll remember, unless you leave. Um, Okay, so any questions about lines? Stuff with lines? No? Okay, so in two dimensions, that's about all we can deal with. Um, but in three dimensions, we can also think about planes. So let's think about how to describe the plane. So these are, I'm only dealing right now with flat objects. I'm dealing with the most simple geometric objects like lines and planes and hyperplanes and so on. But so let's think about how you might describe a plane. Uh, how many are, 
Is anyone not familiar with this notation? You're not familiar. Okay. So I will use this notation because, well, I'm used to it. So the line, so little, this is an aside. The real line, we use R for the real numbers. Because R, real, they go together. And R2 is a copy of the real numbers in each direction. And we consider all pairs of those. So R2 is the plane, which is pairs of reals. And okay, R3 is obviously space. R12 is 12 numbers. It's the set of all x1, well, x2, up to x12, such that x is in R. So it's all 12 tuples of numbers. So this is useful notation if we want to specialize to a specific dimension. We also don't have to think about just reals in this way. We can think about integers in this way. So I don't know that I'm going to use it, but let's just say it anyway. Z is the integers, which is all the negatives, zero, all the positive whole numbers, and so on. And say Z2 will be pairs of it. So, and we can generalize this in many ways. So also, well, we'll do a little complex numbers. C is the complexes. And so on. So this notation is fairly standard in mathematics, um, but you tend not to see it until somewhere around the university or college level. Because in high school, you pretty much have to deal with real numbers, or you deal with integers, and some people are confused about what the difference is. There are these fraction things. Because let's do that too. Q is the rational. Set of fractions Q isn't zero. What else? Uh, I guess they have no common divisor. How about the GCD P Q? So Z is for Salen in German, and Q is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Usually on the bottom, I don't know. It doesn't stand for quintabular numbers or anything like that. Uh, anyway. So, so those are the, the common ones that we'll use and you know, typically we'll focus on Rn. N is not a half. N is a positive full number. Um, although R0 looks like this. Zero real numbers, so it's a point. Not much to do with it, but okay. We probably won't deal much with R0. Um, okay, that's the wrong set. Okay, what, so let's think, go back to this. What about a plane in three dimensions? How could we describe, so let's draw a picture. I like to draw pictures. You can't read my pictures, but I can, so that's all that matters. So here's a plane in the back, and it is nine, I don't know. It doesn't look much like a plane. Anyway, let's try it. I know what I'm drawing. I don't care if you don't know. So here's a plane, and it's an R3, so there's a plane. Sitting in R3 somehow. Generalizing this notion, how might we describe a typical point in the plane here? Right. So I need a point in the plane that isn't this one, or it could be this one. I need to know how to get to the plane in the first place. And then, well, I can get to this point by just taking this vector, 
but that will only give me a line sitting in that plane, and so I need another vector to get everything else. And then I can express everything in this plane as a linear combination of these two vectors. Just like if we want to describe a point on the map, we have two coordinates. Tell us how far north or south and how far east or west. Here we can say how much in the green direction and how much in the red direction. So I can get to this point here by saying go, go to the black point, move in the green direction a certain amount, and then move off in the red direction. Go to red direction. Well, this red direction is the same as that red direction, it's parallel. So direction doesn't have a, a base point, it just has a way to go. And these are supposed to look like the same one. And maybe this is half of a red, but whatever. So one thing, though, you have to keep in mind is I could be stupid and choose my red direction to be parallel to my green direction, and then I'm not going to get much of a plane. So in order to describe this plane, so to describe the points in my plane, I need some kind of a base point. So I have my base point. Let's call it P. I don't know why I switched from A to P, but I did. And then I have two dimensions to add on. I have one direction that I go in the T. And then I have some amount. That's my, in this picture, is my green direction. And in this other way is my red direction. So I have get somewhere on the plane, move in the green direction some amount, move in the red direction some amount, and I need V and S, no, W, to be not parallel. If V is parallel to W, I'm not going to get a plane, I'm going to get a line because then I can collapse these two together and describe in terms of t plus s divided by the length of the I can just describe this as a line. This describes always a two-dimensional plane in any space that is three or more dimensions. I mean, it kind of describes a plane in the plane, but there's only one, so there's not a lot to do. Right? We can describe something in R2 by this, too, but every point in R2 is a point in R2, so we always get the same point. I have no idea if you understood what I meant by that, but what I'm saying is if we're talking about in R2, we can describe points in R2 this way as well. I see the second thing. Take a base point go some red direction some amount and some green direction some amount and for, as long as the red and the green guys live in the same plane I can get any point on the board this way but every point in the board is always represented this way there's only one board to put it in okay I, I answered it okay Sorry. did I answer it? no I thought do you want to oh, share? I was, I was just thinking do you have enough gum for everybody? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just thinking about whether or not you could have a two-dimensional plane in four space. Yes, you can, certainly. Yeah. So, so this will work just fine. These are two vectors with four components, and this will describe a two-dimensional plane in four space, but the complement of that is also a big space. Right? This doesn't divide four space in half in the same way that a line doesn't divide three space. Yeah? So if you want to do space, like, like three space, mm -hmm. represented four space, you would use three. Exactly. You would have three non-parallel vectors. And if you wanted to describe some eight-dimensional space, you have eight non-parallel vectors. So depending on how many, yeah. But like you could still have three non-parallel vectors. And you still have yeah. So when I meant non-parallel, I meant non-non-planar. Non-planar. Non-parallel was wrong, meant non-planar. So I need them to be. So the correct word, which since we're doing linear algebra right here, is that another way to say this is that V and 
W are linearly, linearly independent. And then the generalization works. So if I have three vectors, I need u, v, and w to be all linearly independent. Now, I didn't define what linearly independent means, but you can't transform one into the other. Yeah, I can't express one in terms of the others. So another way to say this, so suppose, so let's go off, and then I'll just never get where I need to go, but that's okay. We'll get there by the end of the year. So, this is not yet what we're really doing, but what the heck I'll tell you now. So some collection of vectors, v1, v2, up to vn. So I have n vectors. And these guys are linearly independent. If uh, We have, let me write it this way, a1, v1 plus a2, v2 plus up to a n, v n equals zero. There's an equation. If this is true, means that all of the a's are all zero. The only way that such an equation can be solved is if all of the coefficients are zero. Then these guys are linearly independent. So this is usually the standard definition for linear independence, but a something that you need to think about to see that they're the same. And when we discuss this, I'll go through it again. This is the same thing as I can't write 1v in terms of the others. So this is a more mathy way to say it. If you think about this for a few minutes, or a few seconds, or a few hours, depending on how long it takes you to puzzle things out, you'll see that these are the same. I can explain it to you when it's a few seconds, but let me not. Let me leave it for you to think about this, and you decide whether it's going to take you a few seconds or a few minutes or a few hours. Or wait a few weeks until we cover it in class. Okay, so that was my side remark. So in general, can't read what I wrote? What's the point? That means that is. It's it is. Uh, yeah. Do you have an arrow over the zero? The zero vector? Uh, this is zero vector, this is true. These are vectors. You should have <laughs> arrows over. Yeah. And this is a vector. I'm, I'm going to miss these little vectors a lot. So I should write them in bold face. Really. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll all the vectors. So there's a V and V. I don't think so. Um, Okay, so the, this is the definition of linearly independent. Don't worry about it if you didn't follow it. It really means this. So coming back to plane, so if we have a hyperplane, uh, I don't know, a k-dimensional hyperplane is going to be, and, and obviously it only works in a bigger than k dimension, otherwise it's stupid. Uh, a k-dimensional hyperplane is going to be something of the form some vector p plus t1 v1 t2 v2 blah 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 tk vk. So I forget who asked about a four-plane or something. So here we can describe a four-dimensional plane in this way. And here, k is 4, so we stop at the end. Yeah? Shouldn't it be up to k minus 1? If you no, if you think no I have k because I started at 1 instead of 0. Oh. If you want me to start at 0, I'll go to k minus 1. But I do math, not computer science, so <laughs> I start counting at 1. Um, 
he, he asked if it should end at k minus 1, but I need k vectors. So if I start counting with 1, I stop at k to get k things. If I'm a computer person, I always start counting at 0, and then I stop at k minus 1. And if I'm really weird, I might start counting at 7 and go to 7 plus k. Anyway, no, that's how many numbers. Yeah? So when you say plane, it's not necessarily a flat plane. It could be like our space. You it's, call a plane. No, it's a flat plane. So why do you call it a hyperplane? Because it's more than two-dimensional. So generally, in English, one calls something a plane. It means a two-dimensional space. Yeah. And so a hyperplane, that's a k-dimensional space. Because it's in, it's in hyperspace. Yeah, it's, it's in hyperspace, but the plane, the plane itself is more than two dimensions? Yes. So, so it's, not, it's not a plane in the sense of this floor. Yeah. I can think of this room as a three-dimensional plane sitting in four-dimensional space, or a piece of a three-dimensional plane, where I'm in four-dimensional space where the fourth dimension is time. And if I just take a snapshot of this room at one instant in time, that's really a hyperplane, a three-dimensional flat space sitting in four-dimensional space-time. So once it's, if it's a three-dimensional plane, you call it a hyperplane above uh, so Or a three-plane, or, you know, you can be sloppy with your words. But yes, hyperplane usually means a plane other than a two-dimensional plane in three-dimensional space. So if you don't use the word hyper, that's fine. Plane always implies flat. So if it's curved, it's not a plane. Other? We good? Okay, yeah. This is in, this is in, so this is in R M, and here M is greater than or equal to K, and each of the vectors P, V1, up to VK are all M vectors. So for example, let me write it in column notation. 1, 2, 3, 4 plus T times 7, 1, 6, 5 plus S times 8, 0, 7, 9 plus uh, I need another letter. R times 1, 1, 1, 1. This is a three plane in four space. And if I add another number here, 5, 5, 5, 5, this is a three plane in five space. But this three plane does not necessarily to, to be a flat plane. It's not necessarily to be a flat plane. Does it look like What does flat mean? Like the, uh, yeah, no, I understand that. I mean, <laughs> this is flat in an easy to make sense of way, but in the same way, this room is flat. It may, one can define, and we're getting way ahead of ourselves, the notion of curvature in more dimensions than two, more than a, uh, more than a curved thing. We can define curvature. We can talk about a curved space in a well-defined way. This is not curved, at least not in the metric that we've written things. It's not flat in the sense that you can ride your roller skates on it. Because it's five, it's, it's a three-dimensional thing. You can ride your roller, it's, it's a three-dimensional thing sitting in a five-dimensional world. Right? So you can ride your roller skates and fly your airplane. That's fine. But you can't use your time machine. <laughs> yeah. So if you were to square any one of those terms, like t squared, uh, then, then it becomes curved? We'll have a different discussion. Okay. It may or may not become curved. It depends oh. on stuff. So we'll talk about that more. But for now, we're just thinking about the easy stuff, the flat stuff. Just like, you know, in, what, before we started doing calculus here, you think a lot about lines for, I don't know, from junior high school till early high school. You think about lines. And only after a while you say, hey, it should be bent. It could be parabolas. You talk about circles. <laughs> okay. So we have that. 
Uh, and I'm like, when, when do we stop? 520. 5.20. Okay, so I'm not way behind. Good. I'm just a building. Um, all right, so we have these geometric objects. And here, lines and planes are kind of the same kind of thing. It's just a matter of extra dimensions and things like that. So for the next class or two, we're going to mostly focus on lines and planes. And then we'll move to more complicated objects once we've mastered them. Um, so, but actually, let's step back a little bit. Let's talk some more about vectors. Um, so, if you remember, I can add vectors. And when I do this, I just add and subtract the components. Or geometrically, if I have a vector v1, let's get it, and then vector w, if I want to add them together, I just take the v and I stick it on the end of w. And then this new vector, v plus w, will be this. which just corresponds to adding together the coordinates, which is just saying, go in the w direction until you get to the end, now travel in the direction of v. You get to its end, and in the end, you've gone to v plus w, so this is fine. I didn't mention, but of course, somebody already mentioned for me, we have a special vector called the zero vector, which is just all zeros. And so we have some algebra of vectors. We can add them. We can subtract them. Vectors have inverses. We have a zero vector. Yeah? How can there only be one zero vector? It makes this one Because it looks like this. Um, it, so the zero vector is don't go in on. And I mean, here I'm being a little sloppy. I'm implying that we're in a fixed number of dimensions. There's only one zero vector for each dimension, just like there's only one vector, one, one, one. Yeah? Yeah, couldn't you also say that any vector has an like, number of zeros in the end of it, so it's the same thing? You can embed the vectors in a higher dimension by sticking zeros on the end. But what, I'm thinking, what I mean by the zero vector, so let's be a little more algebraic about this. So we could, I, could, I could write all of this stuff in the way that if you were taking Math 310, or maybe even Math 211, where we could write some properties which describe vectors by the way they operate together one on the other. We're saying that we have some vector v, so we can, I can give an axiom that says that for any vector v, there, there's another vector, let's call it negative v, so that v plus negative v is 0. And there's a unique vector. Zero. So I'm just saying that I have lots of vectors. One of them is special. I call him zero. And anytime I have a vector, he has a friend who I call negative v, so that when I add them together, I go to zero. This is similar to say, in the plane, there's an origin. There's a special point in the plane, which is where the axes cross. And if we think of this as this collection of all vectors, that's the zero. Now, yeah. it doesn't necessarily have a unique representation in that I can write it as 1, 1, 1 minus 1, 1, 1. It's still a zero vector. I have a special guy called zero. So it would be proper to say that one one uh, plus negative one negative one equals just zero. Like, like big zero. Zero with an arrow or bold zero or whatever you want to call it. Zero. So, so often I will be sloppy and everybody will be sloppy. And I think Nick maybe caught me on this. I just wrote zero and I didn't put an arrow. This is false. This doesn't even mean anything. 
it needs to be a vector for it to mean something. Because if I add up a bunch of vectors, I better get a vector back. I can't two, add two vectors and get a dog. <laughs> I add two vectors, I get another vector. Um, so, I mean, there's some, a lot more properties that describe vectors, like given two vectors, if I add them together, this is another vector. So just like with numbers, if I take two numbers and add them together, I get another number. This is true of real numbers, it's not. Um, well, it's not true of numbers less than 10. If I add together two numbers less than 10, I don't get another number less than 10 necessarily. I might sometimes. But it's not closed under addition. But vectors, addition of vectors, is closed. And I can describe it in terms of these little arrows. I can describe it in terms of write it in coordinates and add the coordinates together. They're the same thing. So if I add two vectors, and it's also, it's the same as w plus v, that is vector addition is commutative. Now, I, I don't need you to memorize all these properties, but I'm just writing them down. Vectors work the way you would expect. But then in addition to having that, as I mentioned before, we also have another collection of numbers laying around. So if you take 308, we'll definitely get back to this in a more formal way. Or if you take 310, or anyway. We'll get more back to this in a more formal way. I'm being kind of informal about how vectors work now. Um, but we have, in addition to our collection of vectors, we have scalars. So the scalars, they need to be in a field. And in our case, our field is, is real. And that is given a vector v, some vector v in my vector space, and given some scalar r in the reals, then rv is a well-defined vector too. And it works the right way. We can prove these facts, but I'm not going to. And, and similarly, there's a special scalar. So the number 1 times v is just v. So we need that. If you multiply by 1, nothing changes. Well, surprise, that's kind of how 1 should work. Um, and 0 times v should be the 0 vector. Now, these properties are not all really independent, but don't worry about it. Um, what else do I need? And I have a distributive law, right? If I take r and I take s as scalars, and I scale v by r plus s, this is the same as just scaling v by r and then scaling v by s and adding the answer together. That works too. And similarly, if I scale the sum of vectors, that's the same as scaling them independently. I really hadn't in planned to write down all of these properties that give us a vector space. I sort of got uh, lost. Anyway, we have that. So we have these vectors. We can stretch them by factors. I guess I neglected to put subtraction. If I want to subtract one from the other, um, then I go the other, it's the other diagonal. That's the difference. Now it's a little hard to see. Let's see, why is it now? So if I put negative, so which one is this? I must forget, this is V minus W, right? Because I put, yeah. So this is V minus W. Um, and the other diagonal is the difference, which you can see by just taking W, flipping it around, sticking it there, and seeing that's where you go. Right, if I take this W, put minus W here, put that over there. You can see that those are the same. Yeah? No, I want to ask. Well, You're lost? Ask. Me too. Uh, I want to ask. Uh, yes. What will happen if we square the vector? It doesn't make any sense. Okay. You don't have it. So, 
This is not defined for us. Doesn't make any sense. We can't multiply vectors. We will have two operations, and I'm getting to one right now, that work like multiplication. But they are not multiplication in the same way that 2 times 3 equals 6 is multiplication. They just share many properties of multiplication, and we use the same symbols. But they do not mean multiplication. I mean, if you think about it, I have an arrow, and I have another arrow, and I want to multiply them. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. I don't know how to multiply arrows. I know how to add them because I just pick this one up and put it on the end. That's adding. But I don't have a good way to make good sense of multiplying these arrows. I mean, I, there are operations that look kind of like multiplication, and we'll talk about them very soon, that give us either another arrow or give us another. But it, yeah, this doesn't make sense. I mean, so, right, in terms of arrows, everything I wrote here makes sense. Adding them means stick one on the other. Scaling it means stretch it by that factor. So if we just think of it as little arrows, this makes sense and that doesn't. Okay? But now that I said we can't do it, I'm going to do it. Um, but it's not the same as what you know, 2 times 3 means. So, So one thing you might try to do, suppose I have a vector v, which is, I don't know, 1, 2, 3, and I have a vector w, which is 1, minus 4, 5. Uh, you might say, well, let's multiply this stuff together. So let's just take the let's just take this times this, this times this, this times this. Well, then let's add them together just for fun. So this actually means something. It's kind of a way to multiply vectors, but it's a number. Right? This is 1 minus 8 plus 15, so that must be 7. No? Eight. Eight. Zero. Eight. 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 <laughs> it's one of those numbers. Okay, so this is a number. And it's a number that has something to do with V and W. So I can define this. It makes sense. And if you just write this down, and I'm going to let this, I'm just going to call this V dot W. Because it's kind of like multiplying. And maybe I should use a little X to emphasize. So this is something called the dot product. Multiply the coordinates together and add them up. But it means something in terms of the vectors. And I want to, so let's look at a few of the properties of this guy before I try and interpret what it means. Well, if I have a vector v, so certainly it's defined for any two vectors I write down. So it works for every two vectors. And if I have a v and I dot product it with a w, it gives me a number, it will give me exactly the same number as if I do them in the other order. The order doesn't matter because multiplication is commutative and addition is commutative. So if I change the order around, it doesn't matter, I get the same answer. So this is symmetric. What's another property that this has? Well, let me tell you, because I have it in mind. If I take any vector and I multiply it by itself in this way, what can I say about it? This is like v squared, but it's not v squared. It's always positive, except for the zero vector. So if v is, no, is the non-zero vector, then the dot product with itself is 
positive. And the zero vector, the dot product with itself is zero. So the only vector where the answer is zero by the dot product with itself is the zero vector. Now that's a useful thing, actually, because, well, let me finish this. We also have kind of a distributive business. If I take, um, if I take two, if I take, so notice that this doesn't make sense. V dot W dot Z. This doesn't make sense. Because this is a number. And the dot product is only defined on pairs of vectors. So this is meaningless. Yeah? I think vector V times vector of W is a number, and number times another vector should be another vector. That's right. So but this should be a new vector. These are dots. Yeah. So dot means take two vectors, give me a number. Yeah. I can't take a number and dot it with a number. Uh, so this dot, so this means something if this isn't cross. this. Uh, <laughs> This becomes a scalar, which then I can scale it, but this is not the same as this. So this kind of doesn't make sense. Once I combine two vectors, I don't have another vector to combine them with. I only have a scalar. So I can make sense of v dot w times z. That makes sense. That means stretch z by the dot product of v and w. But I can't make sense of v dot w dot z. So it's important to remember what are the domains of these operators, these dot thingies, it eats two vectors and it gives you a number. Um, okay, but I guess coming back to this for a minute, the way I defined it, this has an inherent geometric meaning. If I have some vector x and I dot it with x, this gives me a number. Let's call it uh, a. Give me a number. What is the relationship between this number and this vector a? I mean, vector x. Yeah. Um, it's the length of x squared. Right. It's it's this length of this is the length of x quantity squared. Let's see why that is. So I have some vector x which has coordinates x1, x2, let's just stop with that. And if I think about, let's do it in two. It, it works in any number, but let's just do it in two. x1, x2. Now, that means that this direction here is x1, and this length here is x2, this is the ordinate. And by the Pythagorean theorem, this length is the square root of x1, x2. I don't know what I'm doing. x1 squared plus x2 squared by the Pythagorean theorem. Which is, well, if I take x1, x2, and I dot it with x1, x2, I get x1 squared plus x2 squared. So this is x dotted into x square root. So we can pull out the length of the vector by this dot product thing. And this statement is just a way of saying every vector has a length except the zero vector whose length has a positive length and the zero vector has zero length. So this statement says just what I said. Every vector has a non-zero length except the zero vector who has a zero length. Now this is really the square of the length, but okay. Um, let's do that. Again, let's, and, and it should be apparent to you that if we're in three space, you can use the distance formula and you get the same answer. If we're in 12 space, use the distance formula for 12 dimensional space, you get the same answer. 
but this is sort of a convenient way to encapsulate the distance formula or the length of the vector. And another property, suppose I have two vectors laying around. I have y. Let's, let's draw one like that. Here I have y, and here I have some vector x. And actually, let's, let's do the simplest case where they're perpendicular. Let's start with that case first. So this is a right angle, the way I drew it. So I was going to do the general thing, but let's start with this case. And now, what will x dot y be? Well, I mean, so if you know what the dot product is, you know it's 0. But let's see that it's going to be 0. So how can we see that? I mean, you may, how many people already know about the dot product? So like I'm wasting all this time explaining how you think, well, half, those of you that don't, you listen, you guys go to school. Um, OK, so let's, let's calculate x dot y in this case. And actually, I don't want to do it that way. OK, so, so, so I claim that this is 0. And well, in this case, it's sort of particularly easy because I drew it in two dimensions. I can write this as, it's sort of funny that I put my x on the y-axis and my y on the x-axis. OK, so this is the vector y0. And this is the vector 0x. And so when I calculate their dot product, x, they have little hats, x dot y is going to be 0 times y plus, it's not a vector, 0 times y plus x times 0, which is 0. OK. So now, and in higher dimensions, it's still going to work the same way. But let's bend it a little bit. So if I have some angle between them, uh, well, so this vector here is the vector x minus y. And I want to somehow relate x minus y to x and y and theta. So let's just pretend for a minute that we're in geometry class. We don't have vectors. That's not a right angle, even though it looks like one. This is some angle theta. This is some a. This is some b. This is some c. Does anybody remember something about the relationship between a, b, and c? Yeah. The law of cosines. So what does it say? Uh, pretty sure it was c squared equals b squared plus a squared minus two a b cosine theta. Right. So this is the law of cosines, and it relates the lit the lengths of the sides of a non-right triangle or a right triangle. Because in a right triangle, theta is 90 degrees. So the cosine of theta is 0, so this term is gone. And we just get the Pythagorean theorem as a special case. So here we have, you know, this is my c. And then I get uh, x squared plus y squared is c squared. And it's the same because 2a, 2xy cosine theta, theta is 90 degrees, so that term is gone. OK, so we have this. And I want to somehow try and relate this to the dot product to pull out something about theta. So in this picture, where a is x, a is y, b is x, and c is x minus y, let's just rewrite the law of cosines using those vectors. Well, not, they're not vectors, really. I'm just thinking about the lengths. 
Yeah. I mean, are you saying uh, C should be Y? I'm sorry? C should be Y. C should be Y, probably. Uh, C is, no, C is X minus Y in this picture. Yeah. Did I, did I mess up my? Yeah. OK. Right? So, so I just want to plug this in where this is C, this is A, this is B. So it should be true just from the picture. It's a triangle, so it's a triangle. So it's still true that x minus y squared should be equal to x squared plus, I, re, I permuted the order, I'm sorry, but things are commutative in the right way, so I'm lucky, minus 2ab, sorry, 2xy <laughs> cosine theta. So that should tell me something, and I want to try and pull out something about theta in terms of the length of x and the length of y and maybe the dot product or something like that. <coughs> so, okay, so now I'm going to write x minus y squared in a different way. I'm, sorry? No? Okay. And I'm going to write it, this is a vector. I mean, well, it's the length of this vector. So the square of its length is just the dot product of the vector x minus y. That's a vector dotted with x minus y. That's a vector. And then when I started writing down the rules and didn't finish them, uh, I'm going to use them. So I should have written them down, but too bad. Um, so we have a kind of a distributive law here. This is the same thing. I can say, well, that's going to be x dotted with x minus y. That's okay. Minus y dotted with x minus y. So those are pairs of that. So does everybody believe me that that works? <coughs> yes, no, who knows? You're just writing symbols, so whatever. Okay. And then I can play it again. x dotted with x, two vectors, minus x dotted with y minus y dotted with x, minus, well it's plus because I have minus minus, y dotted with y. And then I can rewrite this in terms of lengths. This is the length of x squared. This is, I'm going to reorder, plus the length of y squared. And then this is minus 2x dotted with y. Okay, well, now comparing this with the Pythagorean, I mean, sorry, the law of cosines, that tells me this is a vector, which is the opposite side of this triangle. This is the length of the opposite side of the triangle. This is the length of one side. This is the length of the other side. And this is something. So looking, comparing this to the law of cosines, I see that it must be true, the only way that this and this are equal, but they are because those are the same thing, is if x, y, cosine theta is exactly x dot y. There's no other way that this will be true. So I just calculated the angle in terms of the dot product. So if I have any two vectors, I've shown that the cosine of the angle between them is the dot product divided by the product of the lengths. This is a very important calculational tool. And so the dot product, which more formally is called the inner product, but the inner product of two vectors tells us the cosine of the angle between them. It doesn't quite tell us the angle, but pretty close. But in particular, uh, we get that, well, when is the cosine zero? 
cosine is zero exactly when these two are orthogonal. So we also get that x dot y is zero exactly when x is perpendicular to y. So this dot product thing is a very useful object. It allows us to measure angles and lengths and in particular tell when two things are orthogonal. And notice that all of this calculation didn't use anything about coordinates. It just used properties of vectors. So this, this calculation, although I sort of drew the picture in the plane, even if we are in three space or seven space, there is a plane that goes through two vectors. So there's a well-defined triangle. So all of this stuff works in any dimension. It didn't do anything bad that doesn't generalize to any number of dimensions. So we have a well-defined angle between two vectors and we know how to calculate it. We can tell when two vectors are orthogonal no matter what, no matter how many dimensions we're in. And that's a really useful thing. Okay. Um, okay, so I have a way to do lengths. So if I have a way to calculate lengths, this means I have a way to define length one. Right, so, so so the dot product measures angles and gives lengths. And, and in fact, so I'll just say these words, so we can generalize instead of using a dot product, more generally, we have something called an inner product, which in the Euclidean, in the standard Euclidean space that we're working with in this, clay, in this case, standard Euclidean space that we're working with in this class, this inner product is the dot product. But we can make sense of vectors that aren't arrows in three-dimensional space. Vectors are a more general concept. A polynomial is a vector. And anytime you have an inner product, you have a way to measure angles and lengths. So there's this notion, you might have heard the, wor the word Riemannian geometry or Riemannian metric. Anybody heard this word before? Okay. Huh? So, R-I-E-M-A-N-N. -N. You've seen his name before? Yes. So if it's Ian. His name wasn't Ian. His name was Werner. Um, so Riemannian geometry. This means we have an inner product. So we can generalize this notion of flat spaces to curved spaces and the inner product or the way we measure angles between things tells us how the geometry works, how the space works. We, we can define geometry that works in the normal sense. This is not a course on Riemannian geometry, although Riemannian geometry is a generalization of a lot of what we're doing. But if we generalize this notion of inner product, we get a more general kind of geometry than just flat geometry. Um, and so, uh, there's a lot of people at Stony Brook that study Riemannian geometry, and sometimes not Riemannian geometry. Um, okay, so that was just, I don't know, me saying stuff. Okay, so a unit vector, so sometimes we might want to just think about directions and not worry about lengths. So if you, if you think about like a compass point, this is supposed to be a compass. So we have a compass here and we just have an arrow that moves around and gives us a direction in the plane or in space or whatever. And we don't care how long the arrow is. So we might as well always make it one. So we can think of a unit vector 
It always has a direction. And it's very useful. Unit vectors have this property that they don't, when you, when you uh, use them, they don't sort of stretch things. So just to, to make a unit vector, if we take any vector except the zero vector, and we just divide it by its length, this gives us the unit vector u. Which is just sort of a pure direction, because the length is one, so we don't care about the length. So a lot of the formulas become a little simpler if we're dealing with unit vectors. But I want to mention the idea of unit vector, because a lot of times the word unit vector comes up. And it's just take the vector, divide it by its length, guess how long it is? One. So the length of u is one. It's a vector. Okay. Uh, three minutes. Hmm. So another thing that we often want to do with vectors is you might want to cast the shadow of one vector on another. You might want to take the component of one vector in a certain direction. So I might have a vector here, v, and I want to see if I look in this direction, how long is the shadow of v here? So what's this length? Okay, so this is maybe, let's call it w because I don't necessarily want to specialize to a unit vector w. So I want to know how long is the shadow or the projection of v onto w or in the w direction? So this is a question that is very useful. It maybe isn't obvious at this point why it's useful, but it is useful for doing things like calculating distances between two lines or distances between planes or stuff related to calculating distance. Projecting one thing onto another is a useful thing. So I claim, so when we talk about the distance between a point and a line, we always mean the minimal distance, so that's the length of the perpendicular. So this is the distance between the point, and I want this projection, which is the other component. So how would we do this? Yeah? I think it's like v dot w over w dot w times w. Is this because you're just thinking about it? Or is this because it's a formula that you saw before? No, it's like you can, uh, okay. you, you need to, if you do v dot w, you get absolute value of v times the absolute value of w. Um, and then we know in the end, no matter what, we're going to be multiplying by the well, vector w. Right. Right. And then no matter what, we know that we're going to be multiplying by the vector w in the end because we're going in that direction. Uh -huh. So you'd write that up too, like yeah. vector w. Okay. And then we need to divide by um, w a couple times. Okay. okay. So, so we have this angle here. And certainly v dot w is the length of v, length of w, cosine of the angle between them. And uh, but we also want a vector, so, so, okay, why am I just, and I want to think of W as a unit vector. And now I just look in the W direction. So just what he said. Um, this is not V dot W anymore. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this is the projection of this thing onto that. And since I'm out of time and they're going to come in here, Let's stop here. I'll pick up with this on Wednesday. Um, I think there's some of this on the homework. Huh? No? Okay. So there is a homework. It's on the website.